Our lesson from the Second Testament today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, starting at verse 14. Let us hear what God has for us today. When they came uh, to the crowd, a man came to Jesus, knelt before him and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he has suffered terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The word of the Lord. The topic today is a tough one, especially after the MSU U of M football game. So I will issue a trigger warning to our U of M fans. This sermon is about failure. 
I promise I would have made that joke if my Spartans had lost as well. That was written before that day. Failure is a gigantic subject. If you put the word failure into a Google search or a YouTube video search, you will find hundreds of hits. How to avoid failure. How to fail your way to success. Learning from failure. Our culture is obsessed with failing because, well, we've all experienced it, and we all want to avoid it. It is a gift to us that Moses is not afraid of his failure, or at least isn't afraid of it when he writes Exodus because he includes the stories of his failures when he tells the story of Israel. He could have left those stories out. He could have painted himself in a stronger, more confident light, but Moses wants us to know and remember that failure will be a part of our story. It was a part of his story, it was a part of the story of Israel, and we should expect it to be a part of our story too. I really liked the way that this first reading sounded in the message translation, so I want us to listen to Moses and Aaron's encounter once again. After that, Moses and Aaron approached Pharaoh. They said, God, the God of Israel, says... Free my people so that they can hold a festival, a festival for me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is this God that I should listen to him and send Israel off? I know nothing of this so called God, and I'm certainly not sending Israel off. They said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us and let us to ask us to let the, you take us three days into the journey of the wilderness so that we can worship our God lest he strike us with either disease or death. But the king of Egypt said, Why on earth, Moses and Aaron, would, I, would you suggest that the people be given a holiday? Back to work. Pharaoh went on, Look, I've got all these people freeloading, and now they want a reward with time off? Pharaoh took immediate action and sent down, down orders to the slave drivers He said, don't provide them any more straw. Make them make the bricks and let them find their own straws. Make them produce the same number of bricks. Do not reduce their daily quotas. They're getting lazy. They're going around saying, give us time off so that we can worship God. Crack down on them. That'll cure them of their whining and their God fantasies. Moses and Aaron walk into Pharaoh's court with extraordinary boldness. They don't do any of the bowing or exalting or any of the greetings that we see other characters in the Bible give to Pharaoh or other powerful courts. They walk in and get straight to the point and said, the Lord has commanded. This is a power move by Moses and Aaron. Pharaoh thinks of himself as a god, so to be told that another god is commanding him to do something, it's not going to go over very well. But that fact does not seem to bother Moses and Aaron, because that's exactly what they do. They barge in and make the command. And it immediately goes sideways. Pharaoh is offended that they didn't greet him appropriately. They issue a command from another god, and Pharaoh has no relationship with that god. So, of course, he gets defensive and snaps back at this audacious duo. Moses and Aaron see their mistake, and they try to do some damage control. They were told that if Pharaoh won't let them go into the wilderness, that God would send plagues. But they realize that saying, if you don't let us go, you will be punished, is not going to be a great follow-up to how they started. So they try to illustrate that the Egyptians and the Israelites are one community. We are in this together. They say, God will strike us with disease and death. Instead of saying, God will strike you, which is the truth, they soften the delivery and say, us. It's a little bit too late, and Pharaoh issues an order that makes the brick labor harder 
without reducing their daily quota. This is not to say that if Moses and Aaron had come in bowing and bribing the Pharaoh that it would have gone differently. It is to say, what could they have possibly expected with this exchange? In their wildest dreams, did they actually think they were going to go in there and ask for a free weekend and it was going to work? I don't think so. I think that they knew how this meeting was going to go. Maybe that's why they didn't bow. They knew it wasn't going to help much. They expected to fail. And they went anyway. And they did fail. But when we expect to fail, it doesn't become quite as crushing when it actually shows up. We're ready for it. Yesterday, I was watching the football game with a mixed crowd, some U of M fans, some MSU fans. But at the end of the third quarter, we were all saying the same thing, and it sounded like we were rooting for the same team. We were all saying, we will find a way to lose this. Don't worry. We were protecting ourselves from the impact of losing. We were expecting to fail so that when it came, it wasn't so harsh. Acknowledging that failure is possible helps us deal with that blow that failure throws at us. And it also allows us to bounce back stronger. I heard an interview with a prisoner of war a few months ago, and he was asked what he thought the best survival technique was for those situations. He answered, be pessimistic. He went on to clarify that it was the optimistic ones who died first. They would count the days and say, we'll be out of here by Christmas. This will be over by Easter. We'll be on the beach by the 4th of July as their predicted dates passed by, a little part of them died as they lost hope. Now, we also said that the 100% pessimistic ones didn't fare well either, especially after they were rescued, they weren't able to pull themselves out of that negative world. But the ones who made it through and were able to reacclimate to our society were the ones that expected to fail The ones that expected success couldn't enjoy the days before Christmas, between Christmas and Easter. They were looking too far in the future for some future goal, some future success. The ones who expected to fail every day could shrug it off and prepare for the next day. And they could be grateful for the day that had come. Leaving room For an expectation of failure helps us absorb the impact when we do fail, and it teaches us that failure is not the end of the story. People who expect to fail and then fail learn that the world goes on after we fail. You've probably heard the quote from Thomas Edison that says, I have not failed. I found 10,000 ways this does not work. That's the voice of someone who expected to fail. That's no big deal. I'll try again. My favorite quote from, about, about failure is from Henry Ford. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. This is what it sounds like for a person who wants to learn from their failure. It's not the end. Failure is one of the steps. Maybe it's 10,000 of the steps, but it is part of the process. Moses and Aaron walk out of Pharaoh's court as failures. It probably hurt a lot. The people turned away from them, but they kept going. They knew that this was just a step. The disciples, on the other hand, are not pushing through their failure very well in Matthew 17. They tried to help the boy and failed. 
And that failure derails their faith, and they can't recover. They let their initial failure cloud every other attempt. They don't see the failure as a learning experience or try another prayer. We don't even know if they tried a second time. They give up and they send the boy off for Jesus to fix. The disciples give up. They give in to their failure. Jesus is not thrilled. He says, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? This feels a lot like a parent saying, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Jesus then talks about the mustard seed. And we often use the mustard seed section to be empowering and uplifting. The mustard seed has become a symbol of power and success. Yet when we read this whole story, it's not a particularly uplifting moment. Faith the size of a mustard seed. Yes, we need that, but we also have to acknowledge what is there with the mustard seed. A pumpkin seed of shame an avocado seed of fear, a coconut of failure. The disciples are focusing on those other seeds. They just see the failure and forget that there is a tiny seed of faith behind it. Moses and Aaron were better prepared to notice that mustard seed, to keep trying to tap in to the faith that they had. They knew that failure did not mean an end to God's story, and so it didn't mean an end to their story. Jesus desperately wanted the disciples to grasp this concept. He wanted them to expect failure because he knew his movement would at some point face a failure. Jesus wanted them to expect failure so that when he was put on a cross, that they would remember the mustard seed in the corner of their souls and hold on. Because in God's story, it is never the end. Failure is never the end. It's just a step towards the solution. We must expect to fail. It will help us absorb that impact. We will bounce back stronger we must expect to fail because what seems like a failure could three days later turn into the solution. Failure is never the end of the story. If you feel like you are in the midst of failure, remember your mustard seed. The seeds of failure and shame and fear want to grow. They will be distracting. They will look bigger than everything else in your life. And you will become discouraged like those disciples. But all you need is to find that mustard seed. Those other seeds want our attention. They want our resources to grow bigger and stronger but it is the mustard seed that deserves our resources and attention. When we embrace that mustard seed, we can look at failure and say, I expected you to show up. Hello, excuse me, I'm going to water that other seed behind you. Failure becomes less of a distraction when we expect it to be there. And remember that our story goes on after failure. Jesus proved that failure is not the end of the story. So let's stop allowing it to derail our efforts and our faith. Let's reassess, adjust our plan, try again, and water the mustard seed. Failure is to be expected. And it is not the end of your story.